Well, if you would, please find yourself in the book of Galatians and find yourself, please, in chapter 2. Our passage today is 1 through 10, and we give it the title, The One True Gospel. And I should like to read 1 through 10 just to get this in our mind to begin with. Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes in verse 1, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. Verse 3, but not even Titus who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. Verse 5, But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. In recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They all only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. Well, here we're continuing. The Apostle Paul, as we've learned earlier, starting in verse 11 of this chapter, the Apostle Paul has been defending his ministry. He's been defending the gospel of God that he preached to the Gentile people. And he has to defend it because the Judaizers, the Jewish people who are zealous for the Jewish religion, had infiltrated the church in Galatia, and they were passionately opposing Paul's gospel of grace. They were coming into these primary, primarily Gentile Christian fellowships and were asserting that Paul's gospel of grace alone, by faith alone, just wasn't quite right. It was actually incomplete. They said, you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. So they rejected the doctrine of justification by faith alone. They believed that you must add your work to Christ's work in order to be saved. In order to have even the assurance of salvation, you must add to the work of Christ. So salvation to them was faith plus your work equals salvation. That's what they were teaching. They said, because you wouldn't let them in the door if they said differently, they said that they believed in Jesus, that he is the Messiah, and that he even died as a sacrifice on the cross for sinners. And because they're, they're certainly not going to deny that and certainly not going to deny the resurrection. If they didn't affirm those truths, they wouldn't have had any traction in the churches themselves. So they would give lip service to that. But what they denied and could not accept was the all sufficiency of Christ's life and death for salvation. They believed perhaps that to be right with God. You had to do your part why Christ did his part. His part was to die on the cross and be raised. Your part was to keep the law of Moses. Your, your part was to keep circumcision, the dietary laws, the ceremonies. That, that was your responsibility to add to the death of Christ. Now to them, Jesus, by his death and resurrection, he only got the ball rolling. He made it possible for salvation He made it possible for you now to come along after that and keep the law of Moses to finish that which Jesus began. If you don't do that, they taught and teach, and those who teach those things to this day will say this as well. If you do not do that, you will fall short of salvation in the end. You won't make it. But we will say it here again now, and as we will say it many more times to come, 
if the Lord would tarry and allow us, especially as we go through the book of Galatians, we are going to emphasize, because it is the most essential thing, truth to grasp, is that faith and works for salvation are incompatible with each other. Okay, it's incompatible. They are diametrically opposed to one another. They absolutely cannot mix for salvation. It is either one or the other. The moment you add, for instance, work to faith, it is no longer a faith. The word that is translated faith in our New Testament goes back to a Greek term that probably is best translated by the English word trust, to trust in. Faith can get kind of mystical and you can kind of do all kinds of weird things with it. Um, but trust kind of brings it to a pointed uh, pencil point. Trusting in Christ. So then, to the degree you add works to salvation, you are not trusting in Christ for salvation. So if whatever amount, if you can put it on a scale in my mind, whatever amount of your effort you want to put over here to assure salvation, it's, it, it takes away from faith. It's no longer a faith. Okay? Um, it's no longer saving faith because you're not trusting in Christ alone. You're trusting that he perhaps got something started that you have to finish. Okay? And this is the heresy of the Galatians and why it's so essential to get this right. If you must keep the law of Moses or any other external work for that matter to be saved, in addition to Jesus' work on the cross, then again, you are not trusting in him. And that's damning. Chapter 1, 6 through 10, Paul was very clear, right? Let that person be condemned to hell. Galatians 3, 11 through 12 says, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, who, who practices them shall live by them. So you see that, that keeping law and faith are diametrically opposed and they're on two ends of a polar. Okay? The law is not of faith. It is practice. It's doing. It's absolutely void of faith, actually. So then, let's be clear about the gospel of which we are speaking and believing. Just, just to set this in our mind um, again and again and again, it must be something we need regularly. Because the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is writing to Christians and writing the simplicity of the gospel and the details of the gospel and the doctrine of the gospel. It must be something we need reminded. Because... We're, perhaps people are more like me than I think. We're a bit empty-headed sometimes, and we need reminded. I mean, we need, the, we need the Lord's table every month to remind me. That seems crazy, but that's what it is, in remembrance of me. So then, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, just listen to this text that, that you know well. Now I make known to you, says the Apostle Paul, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which... Also, you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast, condition, the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the simplistic gospel. Now that Jesus has done that, what we just read, before I even go any further, the question is, are you trusting in him alone for your eternal salvation? It is yours by faith, this salvation. You receive it. You welcome it as though it is this gift being brought to you your hands are open wide and empty to receive the gift that God gives. It's to be received, this salvation that's been accomplished by Jesus Christ. You receive salvation, you receive justification, you receive eternal life, you receive the forgiveness of all your sins by simply 
trusting in Jesus Christ alone, apart from works of any law or any standard. The true gospel has to be guarded and protected. And that those who, like us, who it's dear to us, we need to constantly be sure that we are maintaining its purity because we are naturally prone toward works righteousness. That's why there's so many works righteous systems because it appeals to the flesh. Okay? So I, I, it's something I can do, you see. So we need to... We need to guard these things. John 3, 16. Just listen to these verses, please. I know you know these, but just to set these again in your mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes or trusts in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans 1, 16, Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes or trusts to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I find it's interesting that more often than not, the word that's translated believe or um, in these texts is a present participle. It's a present tense. So you could put an ing at the end of these. So you could say the one who is believing. So it's not some past act that doesn't continue. You're believing now. Okay. To everyone who is believing, to the Jew first, to the Greek. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Romans 8, 28 through 30. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised Jew by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. The emphasis is faith. Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. That's like a drumbeat. <laughs> this is the, the gospel of God. This must be defended from all attacks. It must be guarded from all corruption. So Paul, in our Galatians text, He's agitated in his spirit as he hears of the Galatian believers falling prey to the false gospel of works plus faith. As he hears about that, it agitates him and he takes that pen to write. And as the apostle has said to them already, this is a damning heresy they are falling prey to, adding works to faith. And in chapter 3, he even says, who has bewitched you? Who has put you under a spell? So he writes to them, to assure them that the message they heard from him at the beginning is in fact the true gospel of God. To stay fixed on this. Don't move off of this. Don't, don't move away from that which I taught you. The false teachers are very persuasive. They're very articulate. They're very gifted at what they do. Deception. Do not fall prey to them. Stay fixed on the gospel that I taught you, Paul is saying. So as he began in chapter 1, verse 11, to the end of chapter 2 here in Galatians, he informs them of how he came to know the gospel, that's in 11 and 12 of chapter 1, by a revelation of Christ, and he emphasizes to them that he received the gospel, the one by revelation, independent of the other apostles in Jerusalem. He, didn't, he wasn't taught it by men, he wasn't taught it by the other apostles, he was taught it by the resurrected Jesus Christ. Okay, by revelation. And he makes a point to show the independence that he has from those other apostles in Jerusalem. Now what's interesting, in, in, from starting in verse 17 of chapter 1 down through chapter 2, is he frames up his argument on the different trips he made to Jerusalem. In verses chapter 1, verse 17, after he's converted, he says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus, verse 18. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, who, of course, is Peter. And then in cha uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he mentions going to Jerusalem again. So he frames up his, his argument based on his trips to Jerusalem. Why is this so? Because Jerusalem is the mother church. 
That's where the first church was born. That's where the day of Pentecost and the original apostles are there. So it has a great influence over the churches. Okay? And so you want their stamp of approval, if you, if you will, because you, you, you want people to accept your gospel and you want to get rid of any barriers and hindrances to the gospel. And so if his, think of this. If his gospel was different than Peter's, we got problems. We got real problems. Okay? But the point that Paul's making to the Galatians is that independent of those apostles, I was taught the gospel. I went to show them my gospel, and it's the same as theirs, right? Which tells you it comes from the same source, Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing this to encourage them to stay the course with the gospel that he preached to them, and he's going to show them in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, how his gospel was examined in Jerusalem to assure his readers here of its validity. And then verses 6 through 10, he's going to show how those apostles in Jerusalem gave affirmation to this message. And all of this is to assure the readers to stay the course with the gospel that Paul preached. Now, stepping apart from that, what's the so what to us? What gospel do you follow? What gospel do you understand? Do you receive the gospel that Paul wrote in the New Testament that Jesus taught? Or do you follow some other gospel, some other works gospel? Maybe the Catholic gospel. Maybe any legalistic Baptist gospel. Any, any gospel that had works to faith. You see, you have to guard, you have to protect. What gospel are you following? Is this something that somebody taught you and you never really studied it out? Or are you following the gospel of Paul? which is the gospel of Christ, which is the gospel of God. You see, this is how important it is. It gets down to your soul. It gets down to my soul. Have I been deceived? Or am I truly following the gospel of grace that saves the sinner's soul? So this is the so what of this. Now, when you come to our text, please, the, the, to reassure them, he's going to, He's going to show the examination that took place in Jerusalem. That's chapter 2, 1 through 5. And he's going to start with the place. We'll go through this as quick as I can. But then after an interval, interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along also. Um, the 14 years there, I, I would, um, I would uh, just make some uh, brief observations here because I would send you back to Pastor Max in the introduction where he did just a great job of laying out why we believe chapter 2 is the second visit that's recorded in Acts and not the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15, okay? We're talking about Acts 11, okay? All right, so I would point you back there because he, he laid that out so well. But I'm going to mention here in verse 1, the 14 years, is this after the three-year visit in verse 18? Or is this 14 years after his conversion? It's probably the 14 years after his conversion. Okay? If he's converted in 33, 34, then this puts it back like 48. And as you know how Jews count, Jesus was in the grave three days, but it wasn't three 24-hour periods. It was, three, it was parts of three days. Right? You have Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning. Right? So this 14 years could actually be part of one year, part of another, and 12 full years. So it could be 12 full years, but with just a part of uh, one year and another. You know, maybe, maybe 12 years plus two months or something. But all that to say, this is what, pe what Paul is saying. It's been 14 years after his conversion that he went to Jerusalem to share his gospel, which shows the independence that he had from the original apostles. Okay, now, look who he takes with him. This is just fascinating here. The people that he mentions are for a reason. You have Barnabas and Titus. Now, who's Barnabas? I'm just going to mention some of these passages and, and make some observations. But Barnabas was called Joseph by his mother and his dad. And he was from Cyprian, and he was a Levite. So he's of the tribe of Levi. So he's of the priestly tribe. Um, he was called Barnabas by the original apostles, which because Barnabas means son of encouragement. So he obviously was characterized by encouraging people. I don't know about you, but I like those kind of people because I need encouragement. Right? Mercy and encouragement are two of my favorites. <laughs> right? The rest of that, I don't can, you know, whatever. But um, <laughs> um, he's the son, right? You know, of course. Um, the son of encouragement is Barnabas, and he's a Levitical priest, so he's obviously a Jew. 
He's obviously a Jew. He is said to have owned a tract of land and sold it and brought the money, the proceeds, to the apostles. You remember? Because in chapter 5, you get Ananias and Sapphira who wanted to do the same thing, but they were deceptive. Well, the first one who was said to sell the land and bring the money was Barnabas. So Barnabas is a, is a Jew, a Levite of Cyprian birth. He was in the early days of the church in chapter 4 of Acts. And the apostles called him the son of encouragement because obviously he was a, a person gifted in giving encouragement to people to, uh, to carry on. In Acts chapter 9, um, Barnabas is said to have taken hold of the apostle Paul and brought him to the apostles after Paul was converted. And he brought the apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus at that time, to the apostles and said, Hey, Paul, tell them how the Lord saved you. And so they were scared to death of Saul of Tarsus. Barnabas saw the conversion, took him by the hand and said to the apostles, hey, listen to this guy. So Barnabas has a real strong connection to the apostle Paul. He is a true servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 11, the, the, the church is said to be scattered because of the persecution. You remember when Stephen was stoned? As a result of that persecution, the church was scattered, and they ended up in different cities, and one of them that's mentioned in Acts 11 is Antioch. And the Jews that were scattered because of the persecution primarily preached only to Jews. They bypassed Gentiles and only preached to Jews. But there were some that saw so many Gentiles there, went and started preaching Jesus to the Gentiles, and God in grace started saving Gentiles of all people. Can, you, can anything be saved that's a Gentile? I guess so, right? And so the, the, they were speaking to the Greeks, they were preaching Christ, and the hand, it says in Acts 11, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, the mother church, and they, the church in Jerusalem, sent Barnabas off to Antioch. He's going to be their emissary. Check this out, Barnabas. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced. And this is a Jew rejoicing in Gentile salvation. Tells you a little bit about him compared to the Judaizers. And he began to encourage them. Why not? It's his name, son of encouragement. That all with resolute heart, he said, to remain true to the Lord. Luke went on to write, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Now listen to this. That was going on in Antioch. There was a certain man in Tarsus that Barnabas knew. Barnabas left Antioch, went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and he found Saul and brought him to Antioch to minister to the converts there. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And they met for an entire year. And so they had Barnabas and Saul teaching them for a year. And that was the first place that the disciples of Jesus were called Christians in the city of Antioch. So Barnabas, he along with Paul, was also sent to the Jerusalem Council, which is a little bit after the book of Galatians. But it's for the same topic. What do we do with Gentiles? Do we demand that they be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? Or what, how do we go about this? So when you read Acts 15, you're going to find Paul was sent there along with Barnabas. And they were then to carry the, the verdict from the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. They were then to take that verdict back to Antioch and to the Gentile Christians and give the tell them the verdict. So Barnabas has a major part in the early church and certainly a major part in the life of Paul. Okay? Now, he was a faithful follower of Jesus. He even risked his life along with Paul for the sake of the gospel. So he's a faithful brother, a faithful servant. But who is Titus? Because our, our text also says Titus was sent along too. Not much is set, said about Titus. In the book of Acts, in fact, he's not mentioned one time. I don't know why that is. But he's not mentioned one time in the book of Acts. But he is mentioned in 2 Corinthians and different places in Corinthians. And so I just chose some of these here. Titus 1.4 says, Paul writing, To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So he is probably a convert through Paul's preaching somewhere. He's a true child in a common faith. So he probably heard Paul preaching the gospel. God converted him through Paul's preaching somewhere in Paul's trips. In 2 Corinthians, it says here, chapter 8, verse 16 through 17, 
But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on, on your behalf in the heart of Titus. For he had not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you on his own accord. So he was with Paul. He heard about how the Corinthians were earnest to take a collection, a gift for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And so Paul sent Titus to go gather those funds. So obviously he's a trusted man. He's a trusted follower. And he's later on, he's left on the island of Crete to set in order the churches on that island by the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians 8.23, As for Titus, Paul writes, He is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, um, they are messengers of the churches, a glory to Christ. So here's Paul the Jew commending and applauding and affirming Titus, a Greek, as a partner in ministry and a fellow worker and a brother in the Lord. Okay, Now, so you have these two trusted men with the apostle mentioned here in chapter 2, verse 1. They're going to Jerusalem, the mother city. The mother church is there. Why are they going there in verse 2? Is because of a revelation that I went up and submitted my gospel. So in, in obedience to this revelation, they, they go to Jerusalem. The revelation, the, un, the, the, the revealing is obviously from the Lord. The Lord reveals something to Paul that he should go to Jerusalem. Paul obeys the order and travels. And he goes to this behind closed door meeting with the prominent apostles. In verses 2, look at what it says. It was because of a revelation that I went up. Jerusalem's always up because of the elevation. It's higher than anything around it. And I submitted to them, notice... Verse 2, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles preaches the present tense. So he's basically saying, I took the gospel that I am preaching right now to the Gentiles to them so that they would hear what I preach. I want them to hear what I preach. Notice in verse 2, I did so in private. So this is not a public meeting. I went behind closed doors. I just wanted the audience of these apostles, those these men who were seem to be a reputation and he says i preach my gospel to them why in verse 2 did paul what was his angst is that he was in fear that i might be running or had run in vain that's fascinating vain is the word for useless worthless no value what would make preaching valueless that it's not of grace a false gospel would be a valueless, vain occupation, would it not? If you're not preaching the true gospel of grace, people are not truly getting converted, not truly being saved. God is not being glorified through conversion. You're just making a bunch of noise. right? And it, at the end of the day, in the end of your life, it's vanity. It's vain. There's no, no measure to it. Empty holes, chaff. So he says, I took my gospel to these men along with Barnabas and Titus and I preached to them the gospel that I preach because I didn't want to waste my life. And then when you come there to verse 3, notice what it says, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So this examination that Paul is writing, remember, he's making these details known so that his hearers would have conviction to stay the course that paul's gospel's the real deal so he's being examined and notice here in verse 3 that titus though he was a greek non-jew he was not compelled to be circumcised and this is interesting too the word compelled the word compelled c comes from the greek term that primarily means to force someone to act in a particular manner it's to force someone to compel compel sounds almost passive to me, right? But the idea of the word is found, for instance, listen to Acts 26, 11, the same word is used. Listen here. And as Paul's giving his testimony, as I punished them, often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. That's the same word for compelled, okay? In Galatians 6, 12, he says it like this. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel or force you to be circumcised. 
simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So the, the, those two places, there's the same word that's found here in verse 3. So let's look at this. Verse 3. Not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled or forced to be circumcised. So the idea, if we want to get a full picture, okay, compelled seems to be an inner conviction, an inner compulsion. Okay, so it does apply, it can apply to the inner person being moved to do something. It can, as we just read in other verses, speak of an outer force forcing me to do something. Either case, notice what Titus wasn't forced to do, to keep the law of Moses. And we went to the apostles in Jerusalem behind closed doors. And those apostles did not force the Greek to be circumcised. Do you see what he's saying? I'm having my gospel examined by, the, by the, 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 the reputation guys, Peter and John, the apostles in Jerusalem, and they are affirming my gospel. Because here's a Greek who says he's a follower of Jesus, and they're not forcing him to be circumcised or to keep the law of Moses. Now remember, the Judaizers are coming to the church in Galatia, and they're saying you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Here, the apostles in Jerusalem are saying, no, we believe in the gospel of grace that Paul's preaching, so much so, we're not going to force the Greek to be circumcised. Right? So this is big news here. Here's a living gospel. Here's a living gospel illustration to help affirm solidify what Paul is saying, okay? So he says there in verse 3 again that though he was a Greek, he was not compelled to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. It's, it says there that these, that these apostles and even Titus himself didn't feel the compulsion in their conscience. They, they didn't believe that that what the Judaizers were teaching was true, that they believed that the gospel of grace is the gospel of freedom. And they affirmed the freedom that is found in the gospel. Because look at verse 4. In opposition to what's going on here, verse 4, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. This is what every legalist wants to do this is what every judaizer wants to do they can't stand the freedom in christ you're preaching licentiousness all that grace all that freedom and all that love you're preaching licentiousness you're you're giving christians license to sin you need to put down some regulations preach you need to preach law you need to preach righteousness well guess what the gospel of grace is righteousness, right? Now look at this. The false brethren, pseudo-brethren. Isn't it interesting he calls them false brethren? These are not ill-informed Christians. These are false Christians. These are unsaved people. False brethren. False teachers. False apostles. They all go back to one source. The devil. Isn't that what Corinthians would tell us, right? It's just an amazing thing. In 2 Corinthians 11, listen to what Paul writes to them. He says, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom you've not, who we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or listen to this, or... A different gospel, like the Galatians, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Right? It's deception. False brethren. They're not true believers. For, later on in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says it like this. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. They're just like their father, the devil, Jesus says in John 8, 44. Right? You have the father, the devil. He's a liar from the beginning and a murderer. 
So here Paul is saying those who oppose the free grace of God in the, in the gospel of freedom, verse 4, the false brethren, so these are Jewish men who were saying they were followers of Messiah, but Paul is saying they are pseudo, they are false, they are not true. Notice the, 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 the secrecy, the, 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 it's cloaked in verse 4. Secretly brought in were these false teachers. Secretly brought in, not openly and paraded, but they snuck in like coyotes, you know, slinking around, right? And notice they, they, they snuck in to spy out something about the church. Do you see what they've come to spy out? The freedom, the liberty. They hated that. They come in and hear the preaching of grace and, and they saw Christians worshiping and praising God but not keeping the law of Moses. Oh, that can't be. And they came and noticed, why did they want to spy out the liberty? What was their goal? It's at the last phrase in verse 4. Look what it says. In order to bring us into bondage. They wanted to put the shackles back on. The prisoner's been set free. And he's starting to dance a little bit. Hallelujah. Right? This is good stuff. I don't, keep, I don't need to keep all these regulations. I don't need to keep the dietary laws, the ceremonial laws. I don't want to be circus. This is great. Right? They want to come in and handcuff them again. Put the shackles on. That's too much fun. No, no, no. Too much happiness. No. You need to be miserable if you're going to be a Christian. If you're going to follow God, you've got to be miserable. Right? That's too much freedom. We can't handle it. Right? Some people can't handle freedom. They need shackles. I ain't one of them. <laughs> and I trust you're not either. <laughs> I know Titus wasn't, and Paul wasn't, man. Can you imagine Paul, the exhilaration as he was being taught this by the resurrected Christ out in the Arabian desert? You mean I don't have, you mean, can you imagine the exhilaration in his righteous soul, man? He was like, hallelujah. Wait till they hear this, man. I'm going to preach this. Um, and God saved Jews and Greeks, but the false brethren were brought in secretly and they spied out the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. This, this letter is about freedom, right? This gospel is about freedom. Can I mention some things about freedom, please? I, I just, and I, we're going to get there, so I don't want to spend too much time on these, but I would just want to set them in your mind. In Galatians 4, look at what it says, in, or listen if you like, in verse 2 through 5 anyway. He says, or verse 1 through 5, Now I say, as long as an heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he's owner of everything. Why is he not different? Verse 2, but he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. Verse 3, he now applies, So also we, while we were children, we were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5, what did he accomplish so that he might redeem, purchase those who were under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons? Okay, the freedom has been purchased through the death of Christ. We've, we've been delivered from the bondage. He goes on to speak about this freedom in chapter 8 of, or verse 8 of chapter 4. He says, for verse 8, however, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now you have come to know God. And look what, look what happens now. Verse 9. Or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? What's he talking about? Look at the next verse. You observe days. What's he talking about? The ceremonial days of the Jewish calendar. And months, and seasons, and years. And then he says in 11, I fear for you. You guys perplex me. You, you, I'm afraid, right? Why? Because I labored over you in vain, perhaps. In other words, why do you want to go back to those? This is the bondage that he says you've been set free from. Those are the shackles. Those are the links of the chain that shackles the legalist. Keep all these things so rigidly. And he's talking about freedom. Well, a couple more, please. Chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Don't budge. Do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. 
Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. What a statement. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation, duty to keep the whole law. That is bondage. Because you can't do that. You've been severed from Christ in verse 4. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you've fallen from grace. Skipping to verse 13, please. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So the freedom that we've been delivered from the, this bondage to the law, this freedom from the penalty and the, and the condemnation of the law, we are free now to be each other's slaves. That's fascinating. The freedom is not to go and sin like a wild pagan. The freedom now is to serve one another as a slave. That's awesome. Right? Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That means free from the law. If you, if you are led by the Spirit, the Spirit is not going to lead you into bondage under the law. He's going to lead you in freedom. Well, look, he goes on to verse 23. He gave this list of the fruit of the Spirit in 22 and 23. Gentleness finishes it. Control, self-control. Against such things, notice, there is no what? Law. So if you're, if you're living the fruit of the Spirit, there's no law that says don't love. There's no law that says don't be kind. Right? You, you, the law is set aside. And so this is the freedom that is so amazing in Christ Jesus that Paul is emphasizing with his gospel. Think of the dietary laws that are found in the Levitical law and the Sabbath Colossians 2, 16 through 17, Paul writes to these Gentile people. He says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. That's all Jewish stuff. Notice how he said, No one is to act as your judge. No one is to ride herd over how you do these things. Why? Listen. Things which were a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance, the reality, belongs to Christ. So the law is like this shadow right here. Right? The substance is Christ. The law is like a picture of my wife I put on my desk. Oh, isn't she cute? She's awesome. And she's sitting right there. And I just look at the picture. <laughs> you take the law and you toss it over there and you go hang out with the real deal. That's Christ. Pastor Max wrote, uh, read Romans 10, listened to one verse from there in verse 4. He says, Romans 10, 4, For Christ is the end, the telos, of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So he is, to come to Christ is to come to what the law pointed to. In fact, Galatians would even tell us that in chapter 3, right? It's a tutor that leads you to Christ. And once you come to what the law was intended, you no longer have the law. It's, been, it's accomplished God's purpose. And that is to bring you to faith in Messiah. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. We're free from that. Romans 8, 2, verse 3. Listen, please. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free already from the law of sin and death for what the law of Moses could not do weak as it was through the flesh God did how did he did <laughs> sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin he condemned sin in the flesh so why do we want to go back to law do you see Paul's perplexion do you not enjoy freedom why, why, why do you want to do this? I, I just, who bewitched you? I don't understand this. This is crazy. My gospel is, is the gospel of the apostles. And they, they examined it. And even Titus came. And they didn't, they didn't force him to be circumcised because they don't believe that. You see. In verse 4, again, he says, They did all this in order to bring us into bondage. Into bondage. Into bondage. 
But notice what he says in verse 5. Praise God, Paul. He's a man of conviction. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour. Just a phrase, even a minute. We didn't, we didn't give them ground. We didn't yield to them. We didn't fall prey to their lies. We didn't allow them to bring us into bondage. They didn't, they didn't compromise. Now, in verse 5, and I think it's the, really a key to this passage and this letter even, why is Paul so agitated? Why is he writing at such length this personal experiences with the apostles in Jerusalem is the second half of verse 5. Look what it says. So that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Paul is willing to take the blows. He's willing to, because Paul standing for what he's preaching here, the gospel of grace, brought him a lot of trouble. Read 2 Corinthians again. Read all the, the, how he was persecuted and how he was hunted because of the gospel of grace. So here he's, he's standing for the gospel of grace in verse 5 so that the truth of the gospel, the freedom of the gospel, would remain with you. That's why we want to defend and guard it. We, we don't want you to begin to fall prey to anybody's false gospel that says, you know, that Jesus is all right, but you got to do a little more. You know, just to be sure. Okay, read your Bible three hours every day just to be sure. You know, stuff like that. Um, that's amazing. Just as a side note, we'll get to it later. Works is a part of the gospel but not in salvation, right? Ephesians 2.10 says we have been created for good works. That was predetermined before, right, to walk in them. As Luther said, the, 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 the faith that is alone in salvation is never alone, right? It's the works as a result of saving faith. It's not works and faith that leads to salvation. Salvation will then show forth in works done by the believer, Okay? So the works done by the believer to add nothing to your salvation. That's my point. So you're saved by grace alone through faith alone. It's pure grace. Now look at verse 6 and following as we finish this. From the examination that Paul lays out here and, and why the Galatians should stay the course is then... He leads to verse 6 where he's going to give how these apostles affirmed him and why the Galatians should continue following this gospel. Because he says in verse 6, notice please, he says, But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. And why is that? Is because God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. He's not being arrogant there. He's just stating the fact that these apostles in Jerusalem did not add one thing to Paul's gospel because Paul's gospel is the same as their gospel, okay? So the gospel that the Galatians heard is not a deficient gospel. It is the gospel, all right. And then he goes to verse 7, please. And he, there's a contrast, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. This is fascinating. They, they, they saw this. How did they see this? How, how were they able to say that we see now, Paul, that God has entrusted the gospel to you? Right? How did they see that? Well, look at the next verse. For he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. How, does it, how do they know that the gospel was entrusted to Paul? Because the gospel he preached had results. Holy Spirit results. Effectually worked is this idea that, it, that there was work being done that accomplished something. Okay? And, and so... Just as Peter preached the gospel to Jews and Jews were being converted to Christ, go back to Peter's sermons in Acts 2 and 3, okay? So Paul was going through the Mediterranean preaching Christ, 
in Gentile cities and God was saving Gentiles and planting churches. That's how they know that the gospel has been entrusted to Paul just as it had been to Peter. The same Holy Spirit is giving fruit through the gospel proclamation in both places. Now isn't it interesting that both Jews and Gentiles, one gospel. Okay, there's not, there's not one gospel for Gentiles and one gospel for Jews, as, as a lot of people who are off base will say. Um, we'll leave it at that. Um, there's only one gospel that saves. Ever. Ever. Amen. There's only one. And God affirms it by bearing fruit through Paul's gospel and Peter's gospel. Now, remember... In the previous five verses, he went to have the gospel examined. They gave thumbs up, stamp of approval. It's the same as ours. Titus does not need to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. Your gospel of grace and freedom is the same as our gospel. God has proven that that is a reality by bearing fruit through Paul's gospel and through Peter's gospel. There's only one gospel that saves. There's only one true gospel. It's for Jew and Gentile. It's for every ethnicity. It's for every group. And you know how that today the whole race thing that, that we're being slammed with and Christianity is a white man's re, uh, religion and all that nonsense you know that's just it's just another devil slam and slander against the truth there's only one gospel and the gospel saves every every person whom God intends to save from every race and tribe on the planet okay and it's through the same gospel it's through the same gospel the gospel that saved you is the same one's gonna save someone in Alaska you know right Amen. That's how it is. Praise God. I was at a church, a little Baptist church on the Crow Indian Reservation in Lodgegrass, Montana. Right? You know what they preach there? The gospel of grace. And in this little bitty church that is this big, right here, right here, and here's the pulpit, right? Right there, 25 people, 15 of them were as dark-skinned from the prairie that you've ever seen, right? They were Crow Indians sitting next to white ranchers, praising Jesus Christ. It was the greatest thing that I had ever seen in my life at that time. Right? Um, that's the gospel that Paul's defending. That's the gospel that we will guard. That's the gospel we will die for. There's not many things to die for, worth dying for in this life. The gospel is. It absolutely is. It is, it is what glorifies God in the salvation of sinners from every tribe and tongue and race. And Paul is so tenacious in defending it. That's why he spends all of chapter 2 and half of chapter 1 on his personal testimony, if you will, on how the gospel came to him, how it was examined, and how it was affirmed, and why you should stay the course on what I have taught you. Do not deviate from this gospel of free grace. Don't add anything to it. You defend it with your life and preach it like you're on fire. Yes. So effectually it works, sorry. In eight, the Spirit is the one who puts it into action. The Spirit is the one who brings life, that gospel seed that's planted in the soul. He's the one that brings it to life. As God would choose, as God would decide. We're the gospelizers. To us, everybody's the elect. That's not my business. My business is just cast the seed of the gospel. God's business is to save those whom he chose before the foundation of the world. I leave that to him. And he causes that to grow. Isn't that glorious? He causes that to grow. And so the one who effectually worked for Paul is the same one who effectually worked for Peter. The same one that effectually worked for Whitfield is the same one that effectually worked for Martin Lloyd-Jones. And whoever else you want to put in there, Stevie Fernandez. Right? And notice what verse 9 is, he continues here about this affirmation. They recognize, notice what the gospel ministry is called in verse 9. The grace that was given to me. The grace that was given to me. Grace is seen as an entity. Grace, grace is this, this favor of God, the blessing of God. Brother, how did you do grace? God's, God's riches at Christ's expense. I like that. That was given to Paul. And, the, and notice the gospel ministry that's entrusted to you and me is the grace of God. 
It's his grace. If you're saved, you are part of that. The grace that he's shown you in your salvation is the grace that you will see come to fruit as you share the gospel in your realm and in your spheres. Like your song we sang, the one gospel of Jesus Christ. I love that song. In verse 9, recognizing the grace that had been given to me, and again, that's connected with the effectual working in the previous verse, Notice James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They said, we have an accord. Right? We have an accord. We're brothers preaching the same gospel. And notice where they go on. So that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Go get them, boys, for the glory of God. The only thing I ask you to do in verse 10 is remember the poor. And in the context here, I think the poor that he's mentioning is the poor in Jerusalem, the poor Jews, because he's, he's just kicked them out to the Gentiles. He says, oh, by the way, while you're going to the Gentiles, don't forget the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And remember, Paul has at least gone down there once with, with gifts to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. I don't think he's telling them, remember the poor of the whole world, right? Jesus says, you're always going to have them people, right? Um, you take care of the church. First and foremost, you take care of the church. But I think what he's saying in verse 10 is the poor is the, the Christians in Jerusalem, the Hebrew Christians. And what a powerful testimony it is that the Gentiles of, of Macedonia, uh, the Mediterranean, would set aside a collection to be sent down to Jerusalem to the benefit of Hebrew Christians. That shows the unity of the body. That was, that was a huge testimony. And Paul was very, very... Um, anxious to make that happen right and so as he says there in verse 10 they asked me to remember the poor and he says the very thing i also am eager to do it's what i do so the gospel is an amazing amazing powerful reality in our lives it changes men's hearts people's hearts it changes our disposition our minds it causes us now to love god and to love our neighbors ourselves. it causes us to love the unlovely it causes us to love people it causes us to be concerned for the eternal salvation of every person we come in contact with. We don't matter what color, where they're from, what team they vote for, or what, uh, what country. Well, maybe what team, but uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, the gospel is that powerful. But it has to be the gospel of grace, the one true gospel. You cannot foul that up. We have to guard it. We will protect it by grace. Galatians 3, 28, 29 says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So let us defend this gospel. Let us work hard to protect its purity. Let these epistles bathe your thinking in your mind so that you have the gospel clearly in your own mind what is it that you believe right what is it that you believe are you believing the true gospel of grace now are you resting in the finished work of jesus christ are you truly resting in that um that's the sabbath rest that's fulfilled in jesus christ you no longer have to worry of your own soul if you're trusting in him. He, he cares for it. Self-preservation is not Christian. Okay, I believe this with all my soul. Self I've been freed from self-preservation to now care for other people. That's the gospel work in our lives. You see, and only the gospel can do that. So then are we believing this truth? the crucified Savior, buried and raised, and promises forgiveness and justification to you who believe. Do you believe that? You have to battle that because our tendency is works. So we have to battle that. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves that we're truly resting. If I was to do nothing today and Christ came, would I have a guilty conscience? Right? I hope not. Right? 
It, it, do you know what I mean? So many people think that, oh, I didn't read my Bible today. Dog, oh, I didn't please the Lord. I hope he didn't come today. I might not make it. Well, that's not trusting in anything of any value, <laughs> right? But we're trusting in the finished work of Christ. The proof of it is, how do you feel when you sin? Did you lose your salvation? Did you lose your place in heaven? Oh, you like, like losing your place in the bus because you stood up, you know? <laughs> or do you do First John 1, 9? Confess it for what it is, believe in the forgiveness he's already done, and move on. You see, penance is not Christian, as we're going to learn more Thursday, uh, Thursday night. Penance is Catholic, and that is works-based. Repentance is faith-based, you see. Are you believing in this Christ? Are you trusting in him? Any efforts, any blending that you see, repent of it. Don't trust in any obedience of your own. Don't trust in any standard outside of Christ for salvation. Trust in him and him alone. Him and Him alone. And now that you're convinced and we're convinced of the gospel message, let us guard it tenaciously from all error and corruption. Let us pray for opportunities and boldness to speak it and to write it. It needs to be proclaimed. That's its, that's its manner of deliverance. <laughs> to, to preach it. And then I add this, may God see fit to bring revival to his church and to save many. I leave you with this in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your gospel of grace. Forgive us of our often compromising of that which is so pure, so wonderful, so holy. Father, would you grant us greater faith to live boldly for this gospel as the Apostle Paul has given us an example. May we, like him, live a life that is not ashamed of this message even though it may cause us great trouble may we be assured that we have a place on the bus we will not lose it for it was a gift of yours so use us father for whatever days months or years that remain to be faithful proclaimers of christ and him crucified Bring revival to your church, Holy Spirit. Would you fall upon us like rain? Stir us and agitate our souls that our concern for the lost and your glory would begin to dominate us. We would desire to live righteously for the sake of the gospel and we would be faithful to proclaim it. So have your way with us, Lord. Let us live today as though heaven is real. And so we lay it down. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.